The National Broadcasting Company presents Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 12. Soundless. Attraction 12 on Radio City Playhouse stars Jan Minor in the taxing role of Constance Blake. The script was written by Harry W. Junkin, who also directs the production. So welcome to Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 12, Soundless. <laughs> Now, the scotch, Joe. Joe! Oh, get excited, Connie. Oh, you treat me as though I was a... A what? I can pay for it. Let's see your money. I get ready to leave. I'll pay my bill. Sorry, Connie. The boss said no more credit. You treat me as if I was just... nobody or something. Sorry, Connie. Joe? Yes? Please? You owe me nearly nine bucks, Connie. The boss said to cut you off. Now run along, eh? Like a good kid. Bartender. Uh, yes, sir. Would you take the lady's bill out of this and bring us two scotches? Why, uh, why, yes, sir. Just who do you think you are? I'd like to buy you a drink, that's all. Oh, well, don't get any funny ideas. I won't. What was it, honey? Man trouble? What? Or was the booze too much for you? What are you talking about? You? Oh, can it? Okay. Well, here you are, sir. Two scotches and your change. Here, and thanks. Thank you, sir. You want him to drop dead? He hasn't had a buck tip in years. Well, here's to life. Oh, cheers. Good? Yeah. What happened, honey? Oh, don't call me honey. Were you sick? It was talk about some sort of nervous trouble. Look, sonny boy, why don't you push off? Can we have two more here, bartender? Say, what do you think I am? I don't know what you are, but I know what you were. Yeah? I was 22 when you played the Easter Lily. I saw it seven times. Yeah. You were so unbelievably lovely. <laughs> Take a good look and beat it. There's still a little of it left around the mouth. The eyes? Look, Sonny, when you lay off... The fabulous, beautiful, wonderful Constance Blake. The greatest musical comedy star Broadway ever had. Two scotches, sir. This guy bothering you, Connie? Nah. He's harmless. It's okay, Jim. Okay. Just call me if you want anything, Connie. See that Joe remembers, too. I guess so. Well, here's to Constance Blake. Thanks. Still married to Paul Blake? No. Nope. He's making a fortune in Hollywood. Doesn't he send you anything? No alimony? A uh, hundred a month. <laughs> Generous, isn't he? That's enough. He always was a stinker. He just never grew up. He never got over being so handsome. He was always my leading man first and my husband second. He was in love with fame. I think he loved fame What? What is this, anyway? Bartender, two more, please. Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't you relax? Honestly, I'm not after it. I mean, it's only because I recognize you. Because I used to cut your pictures out. You know, I still have one. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah, I got you out of a scale. Oh, what? Sure, I got it here in my wallet. It's here somewhere. My weight and a picture of Constance Blake, all for a penny. <laughs> oh, here it is. With your singleness of purpose, you should go far. 168 pounds. And you, on the other side. <laughs> Let me look. It's faded a bit, but it's a long time since I weighed 168. Those are feathers or something. Egrets. That was the sunshine's bright. The girls were dressed as sunbeams and stars. And I wore a white chiffon dress all over rhinestones. Fluttered every time I moved. Just at the end, the lights went down, all the little sunbeams scampered away. Stars came out, and I sang that song. It was a lovely, lovely song. And when the sunshine fades into the twilight, and stars are twinkling in the sky, my heart is full of sweet, familiar.
Connie. Oh, come in, Goldie. Come out, Goldie. Shut the door. Oh, Connie, you were sensational. <laughs> I tell you to run forever. Oh, I hope so. I applaud you as well. <laughs> Thanks, Goldie. They loved you both. It's wonderful, wonderful. Everything's wonderful. Well, I'll let you folks get dressed. I just wanted to make sure you're coming to the party. We're awfully tired, Goldie. Oh, now, listen. Just for a little while, old man Locke and his wife are counting on you. After all, they did back half the show. But you needn't stay late. But, but gee, you got to turn up. Mrs. Locke wants to cut off her arm and give it to you, Paul. Uh, she does, hmm? We'll come for a little while, Goldie. Uh, sure, sure. And Connie, wear that gray dress with the stuff all over it. Will you? Connie, will you? Oh, what? Wear that dress. What uh, dress? Uh, the gray one with the silver all over it. <laughs> Isn't it a bit gaudy? No, nah, when you're the star, you got to look like it. And I promise you, you can leave early. <laughs> We'd never get home. I rather enjoyed myself. Oh? Am I being temperamental? Mm. You're the star, so why not? Paul, you're cross about something. No, no, it's nothing. Well, what is it? Forget it. Well, what did I do? What did I say? That's the point. You didn't say anything. What do you mean? High-hatting the backer's wife is a little silly, isn't it? High-hatting her? What do you mean? When we were leaving, standing at the door... Had her, when I... she said good night and about how beautiful you looked in that dress. Honestly, Paul, I didn't even see her. See her? She was right beside you. You just flounced out without even saying good night. Honestly, Paul, I was so tired. By the time we got standing at the door saying good night, and I almost keeled over. Connie, <laughs> what's the matter? You sure you're feeling all right? I look back, I, I guess that was the first time it happened. No, I didn't think anything of it. Two weeks later, I was walking along Fifth Avenue and suddenly it all vanished. Traffic, people, everything. Like being dropped into an empty room. You mean like fainting? Oh, what's the use of talking about something that's over? I won't interrupt again. Honestly, I won't. <sighs> well, I started to misunderstand people like... Like the brooch. Hmm? I took a brooch into a jewelry store to have it repaired. And two weeks later, I went back for it. It wasn't worth much, but it belonged to my grandmother. Uh, yes, Mrs. Blake, the brooch is finished. We reset the two big stones and put on a new clasp. Oh, thank you so much. Will you put that on my account? Uh, certainly, Mrs. Blake. And by the way, how much is it? Ninety dollars. Ninety? Well, uh, well, isn't that... It wasn't there an well, estimate that... ridiculous. Ninety dollars for a brooch that... Well, I was I... sure we told you when you brought the brooch in that... However, if you feel that... Did you tell me it would be ninety dollars? Well, uh, yes, Mrs. Blake, I'm sure I did. Oh, then it must have been my mistake. I, um... It, it's quite all right. It was probably my fault. <laughs> But how could you possibly mistake 19 for 90? You just don't listen, Connie. People are always playing you for a sucker. It's your money, but what's the matter with you lately? You want to shake the cobwebs out of that pretty golden head of yours and pay attention to what people say. But I do, Paul. Honestly, I do. Honey, are you sure there's nothing wrong with you? And then, one night in the show, I missed a cue. Everything suddenly got all confused. I, I nearly ruined the last act finale. Well, that was a dandy, that was. I'm sorry, Paul. Everything just seemed to go black. I, I'm terribly sorry. I... Sorry? You stood there like a great stupid cow and left me down center with heart and breath. How did you think I was going to get off? Fall through the stage? Well, it all happened so quickly. I, I, I just didn't notice. Notice? Anything... What do you think about when you're on stage anyway? Dinner? What you're going to do tomorrow? Please, Paul. You I... stank. Of all the lousy performances I ever saw. Just because this show's had a long run, there's no reason to stand Paul, up. Oh, stop, please. Any kid in the cause could have done it better than that. I couldn't help it. It was an accident. 
happen, and I didn't oh, mean to do anything. Oh, for heaven's sake, stop I'm... blubbering. If there's anything gives me a pain, it's you with the weeps. I'm going out for a drink. Please, Paul, don't. Don't go out. I'll see you at home. Don't wait up for me, either. I'll be late. I can't eat any more lunch, Goldie. I'm too upset. Paul and I never quarreled like that before. The way that guy can cut you up, it's it, a big, phony hunk of muscles and profile. Goldie, don't talk that way. Okay, okay. So he's Lincoln and Golden Boy rolled into one. Well, he was right. I ruined the whole last act. So you made a mistake. So who'd notice except our hero? Goldie. All right, all right. I think he's a genius. Goldie, I know that you and Paul disagree about things sometimes, but you don't honestly think that... I that... think that he gives you a raw deal. You don't mean other women? Who knows? Goldie. Why not? You mean he's in love with somebody else? I know he is. Who? Himself. Oh, Goldie. First he loves you, then... If first he loves himself, then maybe you. And believe me, baby, the only reason you got second place is because you're famous. You're making dough. You think that if I wasn't a star, that... Baby, I think he'd leave you flat. I don't think you're being fair to him, Goldie. He's not like that. If uh, anything happened that I... That I wasn't a star. What's the matter with you, honey? What do you mean, if anything happened? Nothing's gonna happen. Sunshine will run another two years. Goldie, I... What is it, baby? Goldie, there's something that I... I don't know how to say it. Honey, baby, what is it? You're, you're shaking. Something's the matter. Yes. Well, you can tell Goldie, baby. Oh, Connie, don't let Paul upset you like this. It, it, it isn't that, Goldie. There's, there's something the matter with me. What do you mean, baby? I... I'm not well. I, uh... I have spells. Spells? What are you trying to say, Connie? Sort of blank spots. My, my ears buzz. I'll be in the middle of a conversation, and suddenly I realize that I've, I've been somewhere else. I, I think I'm going... I don't know, Goldie, but I'm afraid. I, I think maybe... Oh, I'm... Connie Blake, you silly little fool. Are you trying to tell me that you think there's something the matter with your mind? I don't know. Oh, Connie, snap out of it. People like you don't go crazy. They go to a doctor. I'm scared, Goldie. I'm scared. Well, doctor? We're not quite through yet, Mrs. Blake. Oh, there is something, isn't there? It is my mind, isn't it? I'm... I am crazy. Oh, now, now, Mrs. Blake. Whatever gave you that idea? Well, all those questions, you, you're just trying to, to keep it from me. Nonsense. Sit down here. There's one more test I want to try. Dr. Bradley, I'm not a child. I'd rather know the but truth. Now, than... don't get excited, Mrs. Blake. I want you to listen to these notes. As long as you can hear them, say yes. Will you? Certainly. Good. Yes. 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 Uh, yes. All right, that's all, Mrs. Blake. Have you stopped? Yes. Oh, Doctor, what is it? What is wrong with me? Mrs. Blake, there's no need for alarm. There's absolutely nothing the matter with your mind. <laughs> you don't seem to want to believe that, but it's true. Your trouble is something quite different. <laughs> Something different? To put it bluntly, you're, you're losing your hearing. What? You have catarrhal deafness. Deafness? Yes. De deafness? I is that all? You mean all these months when I've been imagining all sorts of things that... Oh, Dr. Bradley, it's ridiculous. I, I've been so childish about it. Mm, I'm glad you're relieved. <laughs> oh. I think perhaps you'd better investigate a hearing aid. I, uh, what? A hearing aid. Why? Well, dear lady, I think it's obvious. You mean it'll get worse? I'm afraid so. You mean I'll be deaf? Stone deaf? Well, no, not that bad, but you'll need a hearing aid. Uh, a hearing aid? My dear Dr. Bradley, you'll have to do better than that. I'm looking for a cure, not a makeshift. Can you possibly imagine me on the stage with a, a few strings of marabou and a square of chiffon and all hung over with, with batteries and microphones and things? 
Unfortunately, Mrs. Blake, there's not much else that can be done. Oh, don't be silly. Really, Mrs. Blake. Oh, hearing aid is ridiculous. Why, my whole career... Oh, God. What is it, Mrs. Blake? I, um... I don't uh, want anybody to know about this, Dr. Bradley. I uh, particularly want to keep it from Mr. Goldman, my producer. And um, Paul, my husband, is... Well, well, I, I don't want anybody to know. Not anybody. Well, that's taken for granted, Mrs. Blake. Um, send the bill to me at the theater, will you, and mark it personal? Certainly. If anybody knew that I was going deaf, well, it would be I rather... I quite understand, Mrs. Blake. So, that was it, my scotch-buying friend. Death. Deaf. Uh, is anything more useless than a deaf musical comedy star? I don't know what it is. I could imagine Paul's reaction if he ever found out. I couldn't believe it would really get worse. I thought a rest was all I needed. And I couldn't just stop and leave the show for a rest, just like that. I had to have a reason. So, I had a baby. I wanted a baby. And I wanted a rest. And I wanted something for Paul to hang on to. I told him as soon as I was sure. Well, at first, Paul was furious, but gradually he came around. In fact, before very long, he was just like any other father. <laughs> What's the matter, fella? Come on, come on. That's it. Oh, that's it. Oh, Connie, isn't he, honey? Whose boy are you, huh? Whose boy? Ah, your daddy's boy, huh? Sure he is. Ah, and good looking, too. Just like his old man. Paul and I, we were closer that summer than we'd ever been. But about a month after the baby was born, I realized that my hearing was much worse. Apparently, having a child sometimes does that in glands or something. It was so much worse that I was terrified Paul would find out. He kept talking about my coming back to the show in the fall. And I was afraid I couldn't, so I took up lip reading. <laughs> lip reading. I thought it would be easy. Easy, that's a laugh. Well, I got to be pretty good, but I was afraid to let Paul out of my sight for fear he'd say something and I wouldn't hear. I had to keep him where I could read his lips. What's the matter with you, Connie? That's the fourth time this afternoon you've followed me out to the kitchen. Are you upset about something? Uh, pardon? Are you upset about something? No, nothing. Um, Harry Goldman, our producer, noticed that I was getting more nervous all the time. He came to the conclusion that I needed a rest, change of scene. So he insisted that Paul and I use his summer cottage for a couple of weeks. Well, I, I was happy about it, but at the last minute, Paul couldn't come until Saturday morning. So I went up on Friday by myself. Well, I thought it would do me good to be alone for the day. Friday night, I went to bed early, and when Paul arrived Saturday morning, I was still asleep. It seems that during the night, there was a storm. Sure must have tied on a brute. Paul, oh, stop it. Please. Every window downstairs wide open, water all over the porch. Plant pots blown over, pictures off the wall, mud and corruption all over everything. Oh, Paul, How to I... get ahead with producers. Wreck their summer homes, get dead drunk. I wasn't. I was Four thousand bucks worth of furniture and you go on a bender and ruin it. Stop it. The carpet stop is it. ruined. The drapes like wet dish rags. Good night, Constance. Are you in your second childhood or something? <laughs> Let's have another drink. Sure. Hey, bartender, two more, please. Come on, 
I almost told Paul the truth that night. I was afraid. You can't imagine what it's like to love someone that much. So much that you're afraid to do anything for fear it'll, well, be the wrong thing. So I thought that if I could only manage to do the show, if everything went well, that I'd tell him then. Just so long as I remained the big star, he wouldn't care whether I was deaf or dumb or, or dead. Well, we opened. Oh, he got brave notices. Paul and Connie Blake together again. I had to watch everything like a hawk. The least change in routine made me sweat like a steer. I knew the show backwards, but I was still terrified. A month after we opened, and I was beginning to breathe easier, <laughs> it happened. Audrey Hart, one of the principals, got sick in the middle of the third act, and we had to change the finale routine. Oh, we had to change it a lot. Paul told me in our dressing room just before we went on, and... I never was so terrified in my life. Good night. There's no need to get upset, Connie. But where's the understudy? She's gone home. Now it's easy, Connie. Just jump to the second chorus after the verse, then ad-lib with me until Barrett comes in downstage with a wheelbarrow. From there on, the routine is the same as usual. I can't. Don't be a fool. I can't do it, I tell you. I'm... Come in, Mr. Blake. All right. But... Now snap out of it. I've got to get on stage. Keep your head, watch me, and stop being a fool. <laughs> Sunshine fades into the twilight And stars are twinkling in the sky My heart is full of sweet familiar sadness And memories that never die I know my love is Back to my arms, away from all harm. And second when ending, the second ending, upstage. Through the twilight. I can't. I can't, I tell you, I can't. <laughs> Never been on the stage since. Of course, I had to tell Paul that night, tell him everything. And I, I got a hearing aid. You can see it if I push my hair back. See it? Anyway, the show just quietly slipped away to nothing. I couldn't keep it going without me, and Paul didn't like that, of course, but he had to face it, that I was the drawing card and not him. Now, he got a job in another show, not much of a part, but it was something. I stayed home. I loved the baby. I loved to play with him. He was so healthy. Nurse Black used to say he was the healthiest baby she'd ever seen. Yeah. The healthiest baby she'd ever seen. I tell you, Mrs. Blake, he's the healthiest baby I've ever seen. You better hurry, Nurse Black. You miss your train. I hate leaving you all alone. Oh, don't be silly. Mr. Blake will be in by one. He's coming home right after the show. I'll get back just as soon as I can, by the end of the week for sure. Now, please. Don't worry about it. I'm terribly sorry your brother's so sick. I hope you'll be better. And then, during the evening, it happened. It happened between the time Nurse Black left around 8 and the time Paul got home around 1. Sometime during those five hours, it happened. But I didn't hear it. You, you murder. Stop it. Leave me alone. Oh, they're going to put you in jail. Manslaughter, murder, anything. I wish they could. You knew you wouldn't hear him. You knew you were deaf. 
You took off this blasted gadget. No, and... Paul, no. I, I sat in the chair outside his room. I, I was reading. Listen to me, please. I, I was reading and I was wearing my hearing aid and I, I fell asleep. I must have leaned on the battery or something. It just, just broke, Paul. I couldn't help it. I must have pulled it one of the wires or something and I, I just couldn't hear. I, I was asleep and I couldn't hear. You let him strangle to death. No. One thing in the world, the one thing that I cared about and you, you and your battery. I couldn't help it. Something broke. Shut up. You fell asleep, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Yes, but I couldn't help it. Please, Paul, please. Yes, I'll please. <laughs> oh, you killed him. Just as if you'd done it with your own hands. Well, get this. I'm through, see? Through. I think you're homely and ugly and dull and a murderer. I'm sick of you. I'm so sick of you I could vomit. <laughs> Well, that's all there is. That's the end. I just turn off my little old loudspeaker, stay in a little old soundless world all my own. Let me take you home, please. This isn't the way to do it. Not this way. There's hope for you yet. Really, there is. Let me alone, I said. Hey, Joe. Make this guy leave me alone. Just make him leave me alone. <laughs> That was Soundless, Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 12, as written and directed by Harry W. Junkin. Jan Minor was heard as Constance Blake, John Larkin as Paul. Other players in the cast included Lon Clark, Danny Ako, Gregory Morton, and Madeline Pierce. The music was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shield. Miss Eve Young, RCA Victor Recording Artist, was featured in the singing sequences. Radio City Playhouse is supervised for the National Broadcasting Company by Richard P. McDonough. Next week, the strange and tragic story of Paul Gallagher, his plight, his bewilderment, and his end. The Dark Hour by Charles Bennett. We feel sure you'll enjoy it, and we sincerely invite you to join us. That's next Saturday, The Dark Hour, Attraction 13 on Radio City Playhouse. Rico speaking, this is NBC, the national broadcasting company.